Well, good morning, everybody. I love this configuration because everybody is going to be looking at the screen and not at me. Uh, but um, when I was growing up in my neighborhood, during Easter time, we had a neighborhood Easter egg hunt. Did you guys ever do that? So around 11, some responsible high school kids would come and get some of the donated eggs from each of the families and then hide them. And then in the afternoon, after most people got back from church, the Easter egg hunt would begin. Toddlers would go out first. There'd be some eggs thrown on the lawn for them. And by the time the elementary school kids went, there were only hard ones left to find. And what I'm about to show you is a, uh, um, a very surprised fuzzing student finding something that felt like one of those Easter eggs still on the lawn. I was really surprised it was there. Um, and then I did a just a normal stack-based buffer overflow with, a, with an SEH chain addition in that, which will be um, a review for most of you. So I'll just step you through it. But the really interesting thing to me is that it was still out there. I thought by the time I get to the hunt, all the easy ones have been found. That was just very surprising to me. I'm going to project my voice better. It's so. hard to hear if that's on the Okay. So all right. All right. Here's my contact information. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. Um, you can call me JK if you want. And the title of my talk is uh, Finding and Exploiting Zero Days. Yes, you can do this. Oh, well, here's the About Me slide that you have to do to all the conferences. Uh, step you through this. Um, kids are getting bigger. Four of them are adults. And one high school freshman with really large feet. And the band is doing well. Both my bandmates are cybersecurity people. Dave just got his G WAPT yesterday, said it was a really hard test. So, congrats to Dave. And over on the left, took a motorcycle trip to California. It was pretty cool. That is actually south of Monterey on Highway 1. If any of you have a chance to do that, I highly recommend you taking that in. And this on the right is the result of a heinous privesk for a Linux executable compiled with NX protection that required return oriented programming to exploit. Statement of humility, of course. I'm just like you. Um, I am not an expert in what I'm about to show you. Some of you will are. Um, and what I'm about to show you is really not kung fu. It's just very basic stuff. Uh, I'm just glad to be here, guys. So here's what I'm going to show you. Too long, do not read. OK, so one time at Bandcamp, I was going through the OSCE course that OFSEC puts on. And I was taking the crack the perimeter course. I finished the zero day unit finished the lesson about fuzzing, fuzzing student, using a tool called Spike. Any of you ever use that? Uh, it's resident in Kali Linux for free. Not well documented. Not a lot of training material through it. Successfully fuzzed the lab machines using Spike. And I wanted to do an op test to see if this was, uh, does this stuff work? Um, or is this just lab BS? So um, I went here and found this. And I liked it because it was a web-based file sharing available for free with the actual app vulnerable application available for download. Um, and so I downloaded the app and set up my target VM. XP was available. It was there. Um, and. Um, set up the app in my Windows XP machine, got it working properly, and then browsed to it in my Kali. Chose a guest session, chose one of those links, and then I examined it in Wireshark. Chose that guest get request, and the get request looked like this. And this is what I would model in Spike. And so when I was done, it looked like this. 
you can see that there are eight or nine variables there. And based on my research for exploit DB, those two that are in red brackets were known to be vulnerable. So if I was fuzzing correctly, what would happen to the server? It should go down if I'm fuzzing correctly. It should go down when I fuzz those two variables. So, so I began to fuzz. Um, and I was glad to see that the first variable crashed as I was hoping it would if I was fuzzing correctly. So it's like, wow, this stuff really works. I continued fuzzing each variable in succession. And um, the other ones did not fuzz until I got to the eighth variable, the second to last one, and it crashed as success. Um, and so my learning objectives were complete for the day. And as I was putting things away, the last variable, so this happened, which surprised me and interested me. So I did some research in exploit DB to see if anybody had reported this particular parameter, the password parameter, as vulnerable. I didn't see anything. So uh, I began a normal buffer overflow investigation that a lot of you have done. And so the next thing I did was I caught the crash in a binary debugger. And I noticed that the, the top red bracketed box there was the actual string that was sent to cause the crash, some punctuation and a lot of A's. And the second red bracketed box just confirms the crash. Notice there is no EIP overwrite at this point, but notice that the input that I sent is three positions down in the stack. And when you go through the OS, the Crack the Perimeter course, that is one of the classic presentations for a structured exception handler buffer overflow. So what I did was I checked the SEH chain and saw to my delight that I had overwritten the structured exception handler chain with my A's, which when you pass that exception to the binary debugger, oh, here's, I have cheesy builds in this thing, so just bear with me on this thing, overwrote the EIP, and that's good news because you now can uh, get at least a denial of service attack from a remote. Um, and so what's the next question? Okay, I got a denial of service. Is it exploitable, right? So I did the standard workup for that. I noticed at the top of the stack was the input that I control. So the next thing I did was try to replicate the crash with a script. And you can see from here, this is your classic Python remote script. You'll notice the environment. You'll notice the, uh, the host variable set, setting the crash variable to punctuation and a lot of A's. And then below that is just how a GET request looks in Python. And then below I put some TCP connection type things with some messages to me that it's sent and connected properly. Um, and so then I tested that, and I got the same results. And so, all right, now we're in business. <laughs> uh, now we're in business because now we have the means to experiment. We now have something that works, and we can tweak and experiment and do it repeatedly. Um, so going through the pattern analysis that a lot of you have been taught, I determined that the overwrite happened at 57. And so I crafted my string with 57 A's four Bs, and then some other things. Sent it again and saw that I had over, overwritten the structured exception handler and therefore the EIP with four Bs, meaning I own the EIP. The next thing I did, although this was not required for a Windows XP machine, I wanted to find out which of the DLLs associated with the app and the libraries associated with it had safe SEH protection. And the ones in red associated with the app itself do not. So I would choose one of those DLLs for my next opcode. So I chose the image load DLL and began to search it for 
a pop, pop, ret sequence, which is what you do for a structured exception handler. Um, and uh, found one that I thought would work because it did not have any null bytes in it. And that is the one that I chose for my return address, in effect. Modified my string with the return address where the Bs used to be. And directed execution. In my binary debugger, set up a breakpoint, sent it, and execution stopped at that beginning of that pop, pop, red. And cheesy, but that means I now control the execution of this program. So now it's getting exciting. So I stepped through the pop, pop, and the red. Remember when that input I control was in the third position of the stack? So whenever you do a pop, it releases the top address of the stack. And the second pop releases the second address on the stack. And there at the return, when it processes the return, it's going to direct execution to whatever is at the top of the stack. Um, and so what is at the top of the stack? I examined it. And notice that it was the last four of my A's. The last four of my A's. And to the next of that is the return address that I did previously for the beginning of the pop, pop, ret sequence. And the rest is input that I control. Uh, so it's presenting itself as a classic stack-based buffer overflow at this point. Check to see I had at least about 400 bytes for shellcode. Most shellcode's about that. And I did. It was clean. So in the last four positions of the, of the 57 A's, I chose opcode that would execute a forward relative jump of 16 bytes. And that's just what I started with. Modified my exploit with it and sent it and saw this is where, that is where it would direct X and two. So that blue line there is the notional position of my shell code. So I created shellcode the usual way that a lot of us use. I used uh, MS Venom, Windows reverse shell, localhost, attacking Kali Linux machine, random port that I use, chose the Python format for easy cut and paste into my exploit. And I also um, ruled out null bytes as part of my string. Uh, and it looked like this. And I pasted it into my exploit. And when I was done, it looked like this. You can see I have a buffer variable. Um, notice it's very much the same. Crash variable in the get request part. And so now what do you do is you test it, right? Maybe it'll work. So I tested it, and everything worked fine. It directed execution. It executed the forward relative jump and jumped to my spot in shellcode where I inspected it in memory to make sure that it injected cleanly and then stepped it through each set, watching the decoding process, making sure that uh, it decoded properly and that it would execute. And uh, it was very clean. So the next thing I did is uh, <laughs> I tested it. So I set up a listener in my Kali Linux machine, port 235, and then in another terminal, I executed the exploit, got the normal connecting, sending indications, which was good, and was rewarded with a nice, shiny shell. Let's see that again, shall we? <laughs> Breaking Bad, Hank. Um, and this was an administrator level shell, which was system. Um, and so, okay, success. So the next thing I did is I made my exploit pretty for OPSEC and emailed it to them. Very excited, heard nothing. So after about a week, I emailed OPSEC, um, you need to disclose this thing. And they never answered, but then the next day it was on the board. And there it was. Interesting enough, a week and a half later, someone else submitted an exploit for the exact same parameter, defeating Windows 7 and defeating DEP with a return-oriented programming exploit. 
and it was pretty sweet. So the moral of the story is that uh, there is always, always somebody better. So, so that's what happened. And this is what we talked about. And uh, this completes my portion of the brief. I'm subject to your questions. Well, you guys slept through this. <laughs> Sir. So you, you took the OSCP? Um, I did. Did the uh, exam kind of require this level of... Uh, the exam requires um, a stack-based buffer overflow uh, proficiency without the need to know structured exception handling. So one level below that is what's required for the OSCP. Would you agree, Michael? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you everybody. <laughs>